Welcome everybody back here on Siegel Talks at the Martin e. Siegel Theater Center, the Graduate Center, CUNY in Midtown Manhattan, not too far away from the New York Public Library in Bryant Park and the Empire State Building. It's a sunny day today, quite beautiful actually on, uh, for a day uh, on uh, planet Earth. It doesn't get any better than this. And, uh, and still the outlook on the streets, is, as we said in the last days, is optimistic. And I think the country uh, feels uh, it's opening up. California officially gave the date for opening New York State. So um, we have been following almost every day in the week since last March. Um, these are the most optimistic days. Still, we hear catastrophic news still from India and the London shutdown again for four weeks prolonged because of the the uh, variation of the, the virus, you know, that it can be traced back largely to India is, is of real concern to us. Theater also will open and should reopen, but the questions remain, what is necessary? Uh, what is urgent? What do we really need to see? What is just, you know, an entertainment? And uh, what uh, is it we should occupy our, our minds with uh, on that short time we are alive on this uh, planet Earth? And if anything, this uh, corona time has provoked in ours is you know what what is important what is not what is worth living for what's missing what is right and uh, what is wrong and also what shall we do with the time and we of course think art is of significance theater and performance is of real significance experience the moment and um and, uh, and uh, we are on the research here to do what to do as Brecht said, new times need new forms of theater. And um, there have been many who created such new forms, people who were with us, Schachner and uh, Eugenio Barba, Robert Wilson, uh, uh, Meredith Monk, and so many who, who, who were with us um, in this uh, year. And uh, also today we have a great practitioner um, of theater with us who will help us to understand better um, the time um, where we live in and what role art has played in his life and what he has been up to in the time um, of Corona here. And we have with us Gerald Thomas. Gerald, uh, welcome. Hello. <laughs> Gerald, where are you? In New York City, Manhattan, 23rd Street, NFDR, inside the East River, quite frankly. It's, it's we're a bubble. Let's face it, we are a bubble. So you can see the river when you look outside your window. And, I can show uh, our oh. audience. I can I can do better than that. I can. Oh show my God! Look at that. Yeah. Literally, so literally inside the water. Yeah. For anybody who doesn't know, and I have to admit uh, to my shame, I also was not fully aware. Of my our great friend of the Siegel Center, Rafael Vienna, said you have to talk to Gerald Thomas. Um, he's a great artist um, um, who is a global artist who has roots um, in, in the US actually, but also Brazil and uh, Germany in the UK. And um, so Gerald is a theater and opera director and a playwright who spent actually most of his time in the United States and here in New York, uh, as well as in England, Brazil, and also uh, Germany. And he has worked in major stages in all these countries. He began his life in the theater at Ellen Stewart's Great La Mama, and he said everything he owes to her, he owes her life, his life to her, and we will come back to that. But here in La Mama, he began working with Samuel Beckett, who um, he knew personally, um, and he uh, staged uh, a lot of his work, important one. We will uh, come back to that. Also with Julian Back from the Living's here, George Batania, who was in our program, and Freud Neumann. And, um, and he uh, uh, knew and worked uh, on place with Heiner Müller and has a very serious and uh, I think friendship and relationship with the great uh, Philip Glass, um, who also talks about him. You can find it on, on Joel's website, a uh, longer interview that is a part of a BBC documentary about him. Um, Thomas formed and established his dry opera company in Sao Paulo, where he has staged a lot of his work and uh, it has a part of an existence also in London, but also is here in some way exists in, in New York City. He has done over 60, 65 productions, a lot of operas actually in over 15 countries. And, um, and he continues as uh, it says on his uh, uh, CV to create work for the stage. Thomas, uh, how, how do you create work for the stage at the time of Corona? What happened? How did you experience this year? I don't, uh, why well, don't? I mean, I 
have, of course, like with everything else, a split opinion about what's happening right now. And but it's it's a funny. It's almost like a, a it's almost like an in joke, or so to speak, because I've had an incredibly pleasant uh, experience during coronavirus because my online production of a play called Earth in Trance was in, was so much, I mean, it was overwhelmingly seen by people, uh, both in uh, July of last year and then again, April this year, two different filmings. Uh, this last production was actually filmed with a film crew and, and that kind of stuff. And, and it was just an overwhelming reaction which rendered me 34 glowing reviews. I mean, you know, I never left my house. I've never left this. This was all done via Zoom, like we are here. And yet I managed to revive a play that was written and staged back in 2006. But in, and, and, she, and the actress Fabiana Gugli was at her house in Sao Paulo. And it was all done there. The place, the place based on Liebestort and on, on, on the last aria sang by, by Isolde in Tristan and Isolde by Richard Wagner. And it's about being, it's exactly about this period. It's about being locked up in a dressing room, not being able to leave because the, there's another singer uh, taking over her part. But the idea of claustrophobia, the idea of being locked in uh, without being able to move, uh, speaking her mind off to a swan uh, is what, what the play was. And I think it struck, this is it precisely why I think um, the audience saw it, they saw themselves in it. Mm. It, struck, it struck that personal note with, uh, with, with people. So rather than go off and stage these, you know, huge things where people are just wondering what is going on, you know, mm. and they, this metaphorical, metaphysical uh, uh, theater with meta language being the core center of it all. This was a almost realistic production where people could actually really relate mm -hmm. uh, to. And uh, wow, well, that's uh, that's impressive. And it's not very it's not very optimistic, but you know, Frank. The thing is, I I I I've always been very critical of what we call theater and the on the other hand i love the idea of the ritual you know we meet at a place we have the camaraderie of the group the audience has to do the same they have to leave the house to park the car meet at a specific place and enjoy or hate experience the production together in i mean together it's a social event here, it's an individual thing, and it's never going to work, first of all, because it's a flat screen, and there aren't many possibilities. Plus, the attention span is not the same. You know that in the theater, you breathe together with the actors. It's like a big lung. It's a heart and a lung beat, you know. And here, you can go off, get a Coca-Cola in the fridge, or get an ice cream, come back, and the play is still rolling. So, in other words, it's not very different from watching a movie via YouTube or of Netflix or something. It's happening regardless of the audience. And I love the interference of the audience when they cough and when they produce noise. Uh, uh, in one production at the Kuvillier Theater in, in Germany, uh, in doing my production of Sturmspiel, which is the Tempest with, with uh, Endgame by Beckett, uh, 200 out of 800 people, 200 got up together like it was a rehearsed thing turned the backs to the audience and marched out of the theater. And it's a, it's a Baroque theater with wooden floors. So you could hear, you could hear the footsteps uh, vibrating in the theater. I think it's a, a glorious experience, really fantastic. Yeah, so they, they, it provoked something in them and they made a decision to, to get up. Oh, Listen, I, ha I have a question. If I understood right, you, you left school early, you uh, studied yourself in libraries and to finance your, your, your life and your, your young, as a young person, young kid, you, you drove, drove ambulances. Um, <laughs> what was going to your mind when you heard the ambulances last year? And I'm sure you heard in your location, many of them. Yeah, I live across from Bellevue and NYU and they go all the time. I mean, it's like a constant siren. 
thank God my windows are very thick and block the noise off. But I was, it was pretty horrible. And in the building, I could see it. I live in a huge building. And you could see the elevator always stuck on the floor because a gurney or, you know, some kind of a, 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 a stretcher would be collecting an old person who would be going out. And then you'd never see them again. So we know exactly what happened. Um, but the ambulance was one of the few things I did. I did a lot of stuff. Like, I guess, a lot of young artists have to do a lot of stuff in order to support themselves. I mean, I wasn't in the professional theater. Um, I started here in New York doing something maybe I shouldn't talk about, but it was, I was a, a kid for yeah. hire, so to speak, you know. And so uh, in London, uh, at the age of 16, I started um, reading everything possible at the British Museum Library, which then, which is where Marx wrote this Capital and so on. But I was a coffee taster uh, by profession, which really is an insanity. An ambulance driver, I was a chef's assistant, of course, or you could say a dishwashing liquid uh, assistant, or uh, I was a telephone, op an international telephone operator. You had to stick in those things, you know, depending on the country that the person was asking. So it's, you know, I got married very early. I was married very early. So I had to support this uh, thing called marriage family. Mm. How, how did you connect to La Mama and Ellen Stewart? How did you get there from well, driving the ambulances in London? My, when, I, when I moved back from London to New York, <clears throat> I... I'm not sure exactly how I got connected to the company called Mabu Mines. Uh, Lee Brewer, Ruth Malachek, Philip, and the Fred Newman. Uh, and so I ended up doing, uh, being part of a production of uh, The Tempest at the Delacour Theater in 1981, exactly 40 years ago now, um, with all these people, Raul Julia, you know, playing the role of uh, uh, Prospero. And little by little, uh, I started uh, wanting to do workshops. My relationship with Joe Papp was going very badly because he wanted me to do all these Polish uh, political plays. And that was not what was, a, a, you know, I want to do Beckett. I want to do more, you know, metalinguistic theater. And so Ellen picked me up and Ellen said, well, do a couple of workshops, you know, teach people how to speak with an English accent, just, you know, this kind of stuff. And then uh, one day I said, Ellen, I'm ready with a production if you, want, if you want me to stage it. And it happened to be Samuel Beckett's all, world premiere of All Stranger Way, which opened January of 1984. I was 29 years old. And, and then I got to know Beckett personally. I started working with Beckett in Paris uh, in 1984, 85, 86. And not until he died because I stopped seeing him for a while. But I got to do all these adaptations of Beckett prose. And then for some kind of, a, a, it really is a coincidence because when uh, my intendant, the artistic director of the Bayerisches Stadt of the State Theater in Munich was Günther Belitz, he had hired me. Uh, and, uh, and I said to him, well, why not do Waiting for Godot? You know, this was when Beckett was still alive. Uh, you being you being German, you know that things begin two years in advance, you know, with the sets and all that. So it was an also almost an unfortunate thing that uh, Beckett died, and a month later we were opening Godot at the Cavillier Theater again. So it seemed like uh, you know I was an opportunist who seized uh, the you know the opportunity to do something because Beckett was dead. It wasn't. It was planned in advance. But so I've also done Endgame, the traditional so-called plays. They're not very interesting for me because I do the prose. I do the internal, you know, dialogue of, uh, of what Beckett is thinking and putting out. And that's the way he was as a person. He spoke that way. He actually spoke that way. I used to go to Paris to meet him. He spoke that way. Mm. Well, one, one could argue that, um, that the over the work of Beckett is, you know, also concerned is um, we will all die. We know that. Um, you've been reminded now by something that we all try to ignore, especially America does try to ignore. But what do we do before we die? What is worth 
doing. Um, oh, great. Uh, what what yeah. how 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 do you connect the, that idea of Beckett and Corona time? Did, did it get a new urgency for you, or was it a confirmation? Yeah, I mean, I think theatre deals with death. This is what we deal with. I mean, go back to Shakespeare; it's all about death. It's all about dying. Uh, all the Renaissance uh, writers write about death, and go back to Chaucer, it's all about death. It's all about death with Plato and Sophocles. It's all about death. It's all about our ability to transcend this monster called death, or accept it and just lie there like Finnegan's Wake or Malone dies or one of those things. So this, uh, we go, I think in a theater, we die every night when the curtain closes. And it's no wonder the, the stagehands who keep the props, they're called grave diggers for a good reason. Uh, we die every time the curtain closes. There's a kind of a, you know, you can only talk about the experience you've just had. You can never really communicate it unless you do a play again the next day. So you're alive again. Here, we just have this idea. And I think, you know, let me just say this. I think the best translator in my time of this thing called death is Tadeusz Cantor. Uh, his theater was about the living dead, so to speak. These people circulating uh, almost like sculptures, uh, you know, covered in dust, almost like post 9-11 in a way. Um, and I lived, see, my relationship with death is ambiguous, like, because most of my family was exterminated in, in concentration camps in Germany. And so, you know, at breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I would hear about Auschwitz, Dachau, Buchenwald, the whole lot of concentration camps and who died and how they died. And of course, I used to live in Williamsburg, which is kind of opposite across. You, I got the, the clear view. I used to have a clear view of the World Trade Center, and I saw the planes hit the buildings uh, in real time and the collapse in real time. So that was a second uh, idea of, my goodness, it's very close, uh, it's very close. So there's a mechanical thing that takes over. I, I think you're right, Americans don't wanna deal with death and so it's always a happy ending. It's always a sugar uh, thing, sugar coated ending. Um, but uh, Europeans, on the other hand, are exactly the opposite. They dwell on death. So all the operas, especially Wagner, it's all about who dies and how they die and how, how long they take to die on stage and how much they can sing while they're dead already. Uh, but this is a typical Schopenhauer. It's typical nihilism. It's, you know, it's typical um, Nietzsche and Wagner, actually. It's, it's although I think probably Nietzsche is a little bit more optimistic with the eternal return and, uh, and all that. But the Corona thing, so the second part of the question, how I, I, first of all, I don't really believe we're over it right now. You know, like you said, the theater might come back, but how is it? Uh, and I, if we take just one example, Broadway, for instance, where the producer needs a packed house or at least 85% of the audience, paid audience sitting there. If it's gonna be one seat with two intermittent seats empty, meaning a third of the theater is not gonna make a profit. So he can't pay anybody. So unless the unions come down from the platform and make a deal, say, well, no, we're gonna work for nothing or we're gonna, we're not, we, we no longer work for 75 bucks an hour, we work for 10 and the actors do the same, and it becomes a team effort, which might happen. It might happen. It's like a war situation, a team effort where there are no classes, where everyone feels like they're part of the enterprise. Well, maybe then, maybe then. Otherwise, the industry as we know it uh, doesn't stand a chance at the moment because you can't sit, you will never be able to sit next to the other person, you know, within breathing, spitting distance. Um, and that's precisely the fun of the theater because you, you're being manipulated from the left and the right and the back. And from the front, you have this magnificent thing, which is unreal, this world 
uh, opening up to you by actors and directors and musicians. So it's, it's a very unlikely situation. Um, so what we should do, in my opinion, is not uh, read the papers every day and put New York One on and, and, and listen to what Cuomo is saying about opening up, what the de Blasio opening up. Yeah, it'll, it'll open up. It, it's opening up gradually. But we shouldn't take it personally. The theater is not going to open up so soon. You know, maybe give it another year. Uh, uh, let these architects and engineers think of a alternative to the distribution of audiences, you know, groups of people, double vac, triple vaccinated, quadruple vaccinated. Uh, I don't know what it's going to be, but you talked about the Delta variant in, in, in the UK. Yeah, well, there are going to be variants. I mean, there are, you know, with the Yemen, there are countries in the world who that, that don't even have a vaccine. And these people, when they travel, they will bring it. And so there's no question that this is a mutant virus, which we don't seem to accept. It's a mutant, there was a Brazilian variant, there was a South African variant, now Indian variant, and the UK variant to begin with. Uh, we are, there's a percentage of us which will be, who will be uh, uh, immune due to this uh, acquired immune, uh, the herd immunity, this thing that we collectively uh, acquire. But uh, I think that exposing us, the audience, to a closed in environment called theater. No, maybe an open air amphitheater. Yeah, well, that's a, like the mm -hmm. Delacorte in Central Park, maybe. Maybe that's the alternative. <laughs> Take all the roofs off the theaters and, and let it happen, maybe. But, you know, that darkness, the black box, and that kind of uh, spectacle to, you know, because the director, as you know, the director wants to be God, wants to control the climate, wants to control the atmosphere the amount of light that comes in. So it's not like a rock concert, which you can do at midday, you know, with the sun blasting on everyone. It's about the brain of the director. It's about the, con the concept, as we call it. And that is not open to weather. It doesn't rain in the theater unless you make it rain, right? It, it, it's not light in the theater unless you turn on the light. So it is the, the, the it's Genesis, happening, the biblical idea of Genesis happening, the fiat looks idea of Genesis happening every day in the theater, well, that will change. Hmm. Yeah, and also, you know, so 80 to 85% are tourists or people driving into New York. And at the moment, we have very, very few of them, if, if any. Um, you worked in so much in Germany, uh, in Brazil, and also UK, and big, big stages. What do you think about American theater? What's right and what's wrong about it? I don't divide theater up into nationalities, you know, uh, simply because I'm always surprised by what I see when I least expect it. I, I can give you an example. I was in Zagreb, Croatia in 1999 as a guest uh, production of Nowhere Man. And I was invited to see a, a production uh, by, it's a, it was an adaptation of Julius Caesar by, by Shakespeare. And it, it was by a production directed by, conceived and directed by Branko Brezovic, a, a, a local Ser, a Serbian, a Croatian Serbian director. He utilized on stage one or two actors from all the different parts of former Yugoslavia, from Macedonia, Montenegro, Serbia, uh, you know, uh, Slovenia and all that. So uh, the language wasn't important, but the, the performance was so magnificent and it was so much about the fall of the Roman Empire. And it was so much like, Jew and I thought, my, and, you know, all these fat men had high heels on with little rabbit shoes. And, and I just, and I never expected to see anything like that in Zagreb, but I did. So German theater, American theater, I think what we can say is that Broadway, the musical idea of Broadway, is a fantastic American response to the stagnant German Italian opera, where people, you know, basically fat singers stand in one position where they can see the conductor and they can project their voices, but they don't move. And if they have to move because this annoying creature, 
called the director, told them to move, they resent it and they don't do it well. That idea of singing for 45 minutes, sometimes an aria can last 45 minutes, even more, is boring, let's face it. Even, even for the theater goers who are fanatic about opera, if you don't know what's going on, and if you don't read the libretto in the program notes, you don't know what it's about because nobody understands what the singers are singing the, in the German opera. In the Italians, because of the amount of consonants, you can understand a little more. But so I think at one point, somebody uh, from, uh, you know, with a, with a, with a, a culture, with an education of, of, of musical theater said, enough, we'll make it into an adventure. You know, we'll use the opera codes, the codifications of the opera, but we'll make it really exciting. We'll do dance and we'll do this happen. And the set is going to change, which Wagner already did with the Gesamtkunstwerk thing, but the, there's transformation music written for, for set changes, but it's not usual. It's not usual. So I, we can, I don't know what American theater is. Is it Tennessee Williams? Is it uh, Bob Wilson uh, doing Heiner Müller? Or is it uh, uh, Trisha? I mean, I don't really understand that kind of stuff, and I don't divide it up into nationalities. What I do, um, see, I have to tell you a little bit about my personal story, why I ended up in Brazil. It's a, because it, it, it's, a, it's almost like a prophecy. Um, when I was directing Julian Beck, he was terminally ill. He was about to die. For the Beckett, it, for, for the Beckett yeah, work. Beckett trilogy, yeah. And so, I mean, we did a, a, a incredible run at La Mama, and then we went to Frankfurt, to Theater am Turm in Frankfurt, where, by the way, Richard Schechner uh, saw us. And, and uh, he said to me, whenever I picked him up at 98th Street and West Bend Avenue to bring him down to the theater, he said, you have to do, you have to leave New York, leave New York. Do what Julian you, Beck said that. Julian, yeah. Mm. Julian said, leave New York and do exactly what you do here, but do it in Brazil do it on a huge scale. They have the money to do it. And they would love this kind of, uh, based on absurdist, maybe, you know, theater, where you just put in ideas, 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 and you leave it up to the audience to, uh, you know, think about it later. And he said, uh, well, build your, build a household name for yourself, and then come back to New York. And I'm sure that the New York Times will give you a full cover page, front page, exactly like it happened. When I came back with the company, with the Kafka trilogy, uh, the Times uh, 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 cultural section, the Arts and Leisure, you know, stamped us on, on a huge uh, cover giving us. And that projected us to the world. You know, next thing was the Vienna Festival, and then from there on, we went. And, and so I started doing things on a bigger stage in the world as well. Because as you know, La Mama is tiny. You know, basically, you can't do anything. The seating is very low. Um, but in New York, what 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 it did in a way, you know, is is in New York, you when you belong to a bubble group, the so-called experimental theater people, downtown theater. It's downtown and it's poor, and there's a a team effort. There's almost like an ideology. And all you want to do is you want to receive an OB given out by the village voice. You want to be reviewed and liked by the voice. You don't care about the mainstream New York Times. You want to, you want a picture of yourself in the Soho News or the East Village, whatever it's called. And the world tells you, you know, you can, you can get out of this bubble. And what, what it, and it did certainly did for me because I started winning all these awards I never thought in my life would be possible. Mainstream, Moliere prizes, three of them, you know, all of a sudden, Moliere prize. So I blame people who want to be part of small uh, groups of people and, and live in, inside of a bubble that has its own uh, verbology, terminology, and, and ways of communicating because it never breaks out. And it never wants to really communicate with, with a larger amount of people. And it's the same thing with Broadway. 
it's about entertainment. It's not about thinking. Don't even think about it. Every production that deals with the deep uh, ideas of, of, you know, philosophical ideas about life and death will fail. They do. I, I did. I did. I failed on Broadway because my production was taken to 42nd Street. My Beckett production was taken to 42nd Street. Well, the same critic who had loved it at La Mama, gave it, given it a glowing review, said, gave it a glowing review again. And the last line said, well, unfortunately, I can't recommend it to my Broadway theater goers. Well, that killed it. That was the end of it. You know, so, I mean, you, it makes you wonder why in the West End in London, well, the National Theater, the old Vegas part, that part of the West End and the Barbican Center, they stage daring productions, or they even stage Crap's Last Tape or, you know, some stuff like that. Well, you don't see it ever here. You don't see it. It's, it's a safer way of conducting the industry. It's about safety. It's about money. It really is about money. It's about ending so that you can catch Saudis around the corner to have dinner. Uh, it's, a, it's a coordinated effort. So the bus is waiting for that crowd outside Saudis so they can be bussed back to the hotel. It's, it's a moving mechanism, um, which you don't have enough. Yeah, don't, it doesn't exist in other countries. Mm. Mm. Yeah. What do you see um, as a future of theater, a theater that has some kind of urgency? You know, I think Philip Glass talked about your theater as an adrenaline theater, and you were this ambulance driver. And somehow when I look at your clips I saw, you know, you have a feeling there is an urgency, you know, signaling through the flames. Um, what what do you think is a theater that would be meaningful that makes a contribution right now? What what do we need? When you live inside of a theater called life, you don't need theater because what is happening politically after Donald Trump, we started living uh, 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 this. Uh, farce of a life where the protagonist was an orange man with, with orange hair, speaking the dumbest possible things, being a thief, uh, you know, basically being the CEO liar of a country or the, the liar in chief. Well, but he is always interesting to watch, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's amazing to watch bits and pieces of his rallies because he commands the audience better than any actor I have known, even John Gilgit. So this lying, horrible conspiracy theorist, uh, 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 he's not even a Republican at heart. He was a Democrat 20 years ago. He paid for Bill Clinton's uh, and campaign. So, you know, he doesn't stand it. He's an opportunist. But we live in a post-Trumpian world, uh, which divided, as you know, the country into really half and half. And after the insurrection uh, uh, attempt on, on January 6th, it, it, it really divided up even further. But that is theater as well. That is theater. That is a Shakespearean tragedy in real life. That is a Pirandello play in real life. That's a Calderon de la Barca play in real life. So you have that when you when you watch the news on TV, when you read it in the papers, you no longer trust the left, the right, the center, anything. You have to make up your own mind, which is what theater really is about. So we live in a theatrical world. It may not be the theater that you would have chosen, that I would have chosen, but it nevertheless it is a theatrical world, and in when you, so we, the theater people, need time to digest this thing, you know, and to regurgitate back something that is an adequate response on equal terms or even stronger, like a good tennis match, because we were caught off guard. We were caught off guard by this son of a bitch called Trump. And so, and, 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 and all this, uh, all these maniacs, these, 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 you know, organizations, uh, white supremacists and all that, uh, which have been around for a long time, but this time stronger than ever. So we 
should use the opportunity of being alone and and brooding and thinking about the future and so on, not not to come up with uh, theatrical ideas, but come out with, we should concentrate on thinking philosophically what the possibilities could be. And that's not thinking about a play, two plays or three plays, it's about our existence, or maybe not, but it's certainly, uh, 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 we have to find and, and re-cement the foundations of our lives. We've been cut from our foundations. The, the building is, is wobbly because it no longer has the, you know, the, the, the pylons that to hold it up. That has been cut off. And of course, because the, we are liberals in the theater, to half of America, meaning 150 million people, we are the bad guys right now because we're in the liberal arts. So it's a great opportunity to take us a back seat and, and think, well, there must be a way out. Uh, after the Inquisition, there was a way out. After the McCarthy era, there was a way out. After each repressive era, uh, you know, uh, the Spanish and the Portuguese and the, uh, the Latin Americans and, and uh, even Germany after the Third Reich had to come up with an answer about about what to do. So maybe Brecht was the answer during and after the, 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 the Third Reich, but each country found its own solution to that repressiveness. Here, I find it equally the same. It's a repressive force coming from the outside, whether it's in the form of a virus or a virus coupled up with an ideology. It's the same thing. We are forced to take a back seat and it's affected all of us equally. Mm -hmm. Did you dream something up? Did I what? Did you dream something up? Did you think of something in that oh. year? Yeah, I mean, I believe it or not, I'm writing plays and, and uh, uh, one of the plays I'm writing is called Traitor, you know, from treason and betrayal because I feel that we as, a, as, hum, as humans have been betrayed by a force of nature and by ourselves. Because you know, we, we communicate the virus to other people. We become the enemy. Uh, I remember the beginning of the mask wearing thing, uh, the instructions of the CDC, uh, the social distancing, mask wearing, don't, the streets of New York were empty. I used to go out here on 23rd Street, I couldn't see a single soul. And whenever we did see somebody, coming our way, we would hide our faces, meaning that person, no matter who he was, was the enemy. So uh, only a traitor, somebody capable of betraying the system will come out the, the winner. So I'm, I'm, I'm writing, a, 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 I'll show you, these are, these are the books and I'm writing a sequel to all of them. It gives me time to, uh, reposition my, myself, you know, think about Britain during the Blitzkrieg, during the bombs falling. Um, everyone had to rethink life, and even in Germany too, I mean, the Germans are not, Germans being uh, Dresden being bombarded, uh, but the, Germ the, the inhabitants of Dresden were not responsible for the Third Reich, but they were being bombed, or Hiroshima, Nagasaki, e each of those that is their life afterwards? Well, I went to Hiroshima in 1989, back to life, trees growing, people living, buses going, taxis, you know, restaurants open. You think, wow, you know, in a place where there was this mass destruction, killed almost everyone, burnt everything to the ground. Yeah, it's bad. I think we will always come back, Frank. We are, we are, uh, uh, undefeatable phoenixes, you know, no matter how, the amount of ashes, we make a comeback because it's our nature. And that's why I think the theater is, is, is an important thing because theater reflects the nature that we are. It, our weaknesses and our strengths at the same time. That's the wonderful contradiction about theater. We can place both on stage but not always within one generation or 25, not, not even two. 
it takes time, which is something we are not used to because the internet gives us quick answers to everything. Google this and it's on your screen and you forget it within minutes. But there, if we only think, well, all right, so this time it's different and it is different because it's the first pandemic in a hundred years. So we, you know, we don't know anybody who lived through the last pandemic and told us the story. But maybe it was the same after 1918. After 1919 or 18 came the 1929 crash and then the uprising of the Third Reich and then the war. Think about all that and how much of art was important to huge amounts of civilizations being destroyed. Well, my father tells me there was no need for art. And that was in the middle of Germany. Um, my mother tells me there was no need for art. We looked at Rembrandt, you know, on the wall. Uh, there was no need to be reminded of Goya's black period, you know, eating a child. There was no need for any kind of a grotesque approach which is what we do. We are grotesque people. We, are, we reveal the grotesqueness in the human race. Well, when they are living that on a daily basis, they don't need to be reminded of it because their skin tells the full story. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to be so brief. No, no, that's, uh, that's very important. So, in, so in a way, you might say we are still in a time where we do not need art, but we have to think, we have to prepare. We, you know how much of us, and I include myself, how much of us really take our ego and our creative ability to the seat called existential questions, uh, or maybe Sigmund Freud or Jung or you, you name it, a Lacan. How much of us really question everything we do in a very serious manner? There, there was no time because tomorrow morning the agent will be calling, is it ready? We need to rehearse in three weeks and it has to be ready in six weeks and it has to be on a stage in Hamburg at the Thalia Theater or at, at Camp Nagel in a matter of two months. There was never time to do anything. We were always tied up with money, production costs, cut it by two days, travel costs. I remember when a set of mine came from New York and it got lost in Hamburg, it went to Johannesburg and said, oh, what do you do without a set? Well, you have, you have to, you have to do it. It'll take time to come from Johannesburg to, to Hamburg. So the improvisational aspect is questionable, but it is also an existential act which we need to exercise. I think for a long time, we've been auto automats, we've been robots geared by a mechanical need to produce. Now, there is no such thing. So sit on your fucking ass and think about a proper strong response to the human questions, human questions, which arise from a pandemic. There is no need for an answer tomorrow or by September or by November. We shouldn't put a date on these things. How, how can you put a date on anything? It doesn't, it doesn't have, the only things that should have a date are vaccines. I need it ready by then. So work your asses off. So science maybe has a date, but this is a very intricate mechanism which does not always respond to pressure. Hmm. Um, I, I think after 9-11, you ask Ellen Stewart in that interview you did with her, is the world better now or is it worse? What do you think about now? Is the world better or is it worse? It's more adult. It, you know, uh, America never had a war at home except for Pearl Harbor, which is Hawaii. It's all the way, you know, it's not really, it's an island. We never had the war here at home. We always sent people to Normandy, we people, you know, we, we sent people in, to Afghanistan, Iraq, all the, Vietnam, all the wars, and they all came back in body bags. But we don't know what it's like to be hit in the middle of a city 
like with uh, those two planes. And that, um, as traumatic as it is, and you can hear it on my voice, this is asbestos. My voice was never like this because I worked at Ground Zero as a volunteer for three weeks, uh, three months, I'm sorry. Um, this, the, the, the impact of that, you can, you can certainly uh, camouflage it with George Bush's, we'll be back, dead or alive, you know, catch us out. Or, but I think most of the people in New York or in America understand that life hangs by a very thin thread and, uh, and that things can happen that nobody ever expected could be possible. So I think we grew up, a war, if it does anything to you, it makes you grow up very quickly. Um, this is the, you know, you don't need to read Clausewitz to understand that the syndrome of war, post-war is something that is imprinted in you like Kafka, like Kafka's uh, nightmares or the idea of becoming a, a bug in metamorphosis or the trial being imprisoned without any uh, reason whatsoever with no guilt, apparent guilt. Uh, those are traumas that, that, um, that Kafka acquired as, as, a, as a child speaking German in Prague, in, in the Czech uh, Republic, the, the Jewish, German Jewish community spoke German in, in, a, in a country that wasn't a German speaking country, a Slavic country. So that was an imprinted trauma. And I like to explain to people, you're German and you know it, but I like to explain to people that Traum is dream and Trauma is a deep wound only aided by one letter, the letter A at the end. Um, except for the spelling of Albtraum, you know, uh, the uh, nightmare, or the dream of the Alps, differently spelled. But you can, oh, I'm living an Albtrauming. I'm in the Alps. I used to live in Bengen, so in the Alps. Um, it is a dream, but how much does it, is the contradiction included in the word? Um, meaning it can easily turn into a nightmare and a Traum, can easily turn into trauma depending on the circumstances. And those circumstances, which we highly regard in the theater because it's that moment where it flops, the, the plot flops to a different thing, is caught in real life by tragedy when you least expect it. That's when you think, oh, you know, the hand of God, there's ex machina, the hand of God has given you a slap in the face, deal with it, grow up, deal with it. Well, you yeah. mm -hmm. I mean, don't we all dream of, I mean, I do, I can say, I mean, I am, you know, still a hippie, I believe. I'm a guy from the counterculture movements of the 1960s, a beatnik, directed Julian Beck, very closely connected to the ideals. I was in Woodstock, very closely connected with that kind of a lifestyle and ideals, but, I think of myself, well, I'd love to have a, a house in Florida, <laughs> in Miami or nearby, you know, a huge pool. Uh, I'd like to go swimming. I'd like to have a boat and do some fishing. It's the bourgeois, the bourgeois in me and the bourgeois in everyone comes alive in, in times of these where you, you're restrained to basically the minimum. And you, you should question that. Who are you really? Are you the bourgeois in, inside of you? Are you repressing that bourgeois? Or do you stick by the principles that you uh, are committed to and that you announced to the world that you were? Well, that's a difficult question to answer. Sometimes, sometimes all I want is money and to live in Montana or Nebraska in the middle of nothing with a huge farm and 25 goats, you know, and 10 horses and 10 dogs. Well, but what else? What was the point, right? Mm. I mean, the whole, after maybe a year, you would go crazy, long to come back to a city and, and deal with people and, and, and get, uh, you know, nervous about this, that, and the other, and politics and all this shit happening in the world. But mm. we don't need it in reality. Do we need, I, I'm asking you, do we need to know 
what Biden is telling Putin right now in Geneva? Is that necessary? Is it going to change anything? It's all lies anyway. You know, it's all the departments of the press department and the Department of Communications that put together a press release and announce it back to them. And we know we'll never know what they really talk about. We'll never know. We still don't know what John, who killed John Kennedy. We still don't know anything. It's still a conspiracy. People think that Elvis Presley is alive and living, <laughs> vegetating in Memphis, Tennessee. It's, isn't it fascinating that you cannot really convince anybody of anything? And, and, the, and pe we people in the theater want to convince people of something. All we do is we put a temporary halt on that kind of a definitive answer. And we give them a little room to, oh, that was too good. I cried, I don't know why I cried. It was wonderful, I laughed. I don't know why I laughed. So we give them that suspension of disbelief, basically what it is. But they'll go back to the cynicism imprinted upon them by, by politics and daily life and history. History, history. It's always a pact between a few people and we are caught in the middle. It's always a pact. You know, no matter if, if it's a politician you like or you don't like, it's your party, it's the opposite party, it doesn't matter. It's always a pact behind closed doors or the situation room and it's hard to believe that it's true. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, and this was kind of a pessimistic view on history, which you also, in a way, share with Heiner Müller. You spoke about the machine, the idea of the machine, uh, the yeah. importance of history, and that it is important to know about history because you don't learn from history. We know we don't learn from it, and that's it's important to know. And um, but also Müller's sense of you know of of of, a, of, of history and politics and real politics and also the classics. You worked with Backhead, you also worked with Hannah Muller, he came to your openings. Um, what was your relationship to him and what would he think now? You mean Hannah? Yeah. I think he was actually a very funny guy. I mean, he was, you know, uh, when he lowered his head with his half a, a little bit left of a cigar in his fingers uh, through those thick uh, glasses, there was always a, 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 a funny commentary to be made. And I remember he took me to see, there was a, a conference in New York. He stayed at my place in Brooklyn at the time. And we went together to a pen, pen conference of writers. And, the, and Norman Mailer was the, the, you know, the leader, the chief, the, whatever, the boss at the moment. And Norman Mailer had written a play about Marilyn Monroe and staged it. And we all needed to stay there and watch it. It was dreadful. It was absolutely awful. You know, the acting was really bad. The lines were terrible. And Heine, and I said, listen, let's just leave. And Heine said, no, no, we need to be exposed to the grotesque so we can answer, so we can answer it. And, and at the end, I said, you know, Heine, are we going to speak to Mela? Are we going to say congratulations? Or are we going to be truthful and say, this is horrendous? We didn't need to because there was a critic, uh, a, a, a former critic from New York called John Simon, I think originally from Yugoslavia, who, uh, who said, my goodness, you guys must have hated it, right? And we said, yeah, oh, good, I didn't, but I'll tell Norman. Uh, <laughs> so I said, Heine, let's go. And we, he, he loved being a kid. Heine Miller loved being a child, running from a restaurant without paying. You'd never think that, but in New York he did, in Brazil he did too, in Rio and Sao Paulo. He loved uh, the attention that he didn't get in Germany because the Stasi scandal was, you know, is he an agent? It was he an agent. Is there an ambulance passing by? Yeah, oh. yeah. Um, so he was, um, he loved the fact, he couldn't believe because uh, he couldn't believe the fact that he was known in Brazil. He was recognized and known in Brazil. And I'm responsible for that because I opened Quartet in Brazil as well with two of the most, you know, famous, the grand dame of the Brazilian theater and, you know, the, uh, the actor. So he came to the opening and he was just, he couldn't believe that it was done on such a scale and that he would be giving so many interviews without 
the fury and the rancor of the German journalists who didn't like him, um, like Benjamin Hendricks in Die Zeit or mm -hmm. uh, uh, Peter Eden in the- Peter Eden in, hated him. Yeah, yeah Peter Eden mm -hmm. in, in Frankfurt der Rundschau, precisely that production, the Beckett trilogy brought over by Peter Eden is what made Heiner Müller contact me because his uh, agent at the uh, Vertrag, uh, the Verlag der Autoren, der Autoren yeah, of Walter something said, Heiner, you must come to, you must come to uh, uh, Frankfurt and, and watch this. And that's where he came. So in a, in a way, uh, it was, it was uh, Peter Eden who was responsible for my connection with, with Heiner Müller. In a way, one could say both Beckett um, and, and Hannah Müller marked some kind of an end of a uh, writing for the theater or a turning point. So, yeah. Hannah Müller, perhaps in a more dramaturgical idea, this brilliant Hamlet machine he did, Beckett, who perhaps brought the form to an end where perhaps not so much more formal innovation was even thinkable, except perhaps the lights and lines of movement. Um, do you, um, do you think um, that uh, after them, you knew both of them, both of them, you know, first of all, what are their connections? Where were they different? And where is playwriting going after them? That's a wonderful question. I wish I had the answer. Uh, I think Beckett wrote from the heart and the mind, but there was a, a huge connection between this and here. And what he saw, he wrote. And of course, there was a word play, and he fooled everybody by saying that he wrote in French, and then transmitted its bullshit. Uh, the, the you know the name Lucky does not exist in French. Godot would be Dieu. It's God. You know the words like that. Ham uh, is a ham actor, and 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 ham shinken, meaning it, it does, those words don't exist in French. And Heiner Miller was a structural investigator. Uh, almost like the architect, but also the structural engineer who needed to see the inner workings of a play, who dissected the inner workings of a play, revealed them to us. I don't know if Heiner Miller is for a wide audience or maybe just for an audience of theater people because what he does with Hamlet, what he does with Medea Material, what he does with uh, the Landrocker or all of the plays that he's, is to reveal the trick within uh, dramaturgy. And so I don't know that the audience wants to know that in, in the same way that an audience, uh, somebody wants to buy an automobile, does not want to go to a garage and see it all stripped and the carcass of, you know, the skeleton and, and being put, he wants the ready-made car ready to drive. So that machine was taken apart by Hannah Miller the autopsy of drama was made by Hannah Miller, while Beckett was still doing drama. So the, I think Hannah Miller was a little bit more advanced in, in, in front of, because he was already critical of Beckett. Um, he didn't really want to know much about my relationship with Beckett. He never really asked much. And he always asked, he always laughed uh, at my knowledge of historic facts in the theater. He said, well, it's not necessary, it's not important, you know, uh, it's important to be the uh, read the first 20 pages of something in the last 20, pages, leave the middle, the middle is the ego of the author. Yeah, you know, uh, but Hamlet Machine and Media Material are still incredibly strong, impactful statements, but I would put them on a podium as a lecturer not necessarily as a director on the stage. Now, after having done so much Hannah Miller, of course, I can say that. But of course, the experience of working with Hannah Miller, him being there, his opinions on Carmen Confilter, my production, that he was vital to because he really wrote half of it. Um, it's, there's no price to that. And there's no price when you've been, when you've been through Hannah Miller, you're not the same ever again. It's the same with Beckett. You're just not the same. You've grown. Mm. Yeah, yeah. In, grown. In, in, in a way, what you said about the time we live in, and, uh, and so something 
something um, has happened. What, but what do you think? I mean, you talked about your, your, your dry opera company, say, ask me in 20 years if it's still standing, lying, if it's dead, you know, it's almost 20 years later. So where are we? And, <laughs> um, and what, what are, are you dreaming on? Is Utopia, is, you talked also about Utopia, especially also when you talked about the great Julian Back, who actually, if I'm right, died on the tour. Performing your yeah, work, yeah, yeah, performing, yeah, yeah. Um, performing your work. So, what what is happening? Is that dead? Is that auto, is it dead? Do should people dream on? What do you say to young? Um, you know, if you would be, you know, talk to the young kid, you know, came to Alan Stewart. That's your two other. What do you say now? What do you say? Dream. Keep on dreaming. You cannot kill a dream. Never kill a dream because that in the dream may be the answer to future questions. Um, don't ever kill utopia. Don't ever kill the hope. Hope. Um, it's almost like a, a, a phony thing to say. It's almost tacky. Uh, but hope is the most important thing, especially after having lived through a heavy, you know, a heavy period. This is a heavy period. Uh, if you don't have that, if you cannot dream, if you cannot take the time to pay attention to your dreams, if you don't have the time to relish your hope and make it into something concrete, then there is no point. But if you do, you'll gain a lot from it. So that's when I do a workshop. That's always, no matter how pessimistic I may be personally, the message is always a hopeful one because The youth is the future, and, and there is no denying that. So I may recognize that my time uh, is over soon, will be over soon. Uh, I'm 60, I'll be 67. So I mean, you know, uh, like Peter Brook, Peter Brook's heydays with Mahabharata or the Conference of the Birds, uh, all that stuff was, you know, until he reached 55 or so. After that, it just became, you know, another cherry orchard and a Beckett piece and this and the other. You lose that adventure, the impetus of being an adventurer. If you lose that, forget it. Um, you have to keep renewing the pact, almost like Faust and Mephistopheles. You have to renew the Goethean pact with the devil every day, every day. And, uh, uh, and, and you know, you, and of course, you know, make a pact uh, with the devil is not exactly a pleasant thing. You may be very atrocious. You may be doing atrocious things to yourself and other people. But if it sparks, there is a flame. If it doesn't spark, there is no fire. So it needs, you know, friction is necessary. This is what pe people don't remember. They want everything to be smooth. Things are not. Even birth, the amount of blood the woman loses in What comes out of that? It's just, think about the pain of all that. It's so painful to be born. It's so mm -hmm. painful for that little baby to be, you know, hung upside down and being slapped and that not being able to express and understanding and growing, growing is painful. The bones hurt within the body. Everything hurts. Yeah. And Still, then, we celebrate it, right? We, we celebrate <laughs> the birthday. <laughs> yes, we celebrate it. Well, we celebrate it because we don't remember that day. You know? We remember the cake, but we don't remember that day. And then there is a period, uh, which I call a plateau, you know, like maybe between 30 and 50, where everything is wonderful and stuff. And then it's the way down again, you know? So you, what is the point when you're at your wisest and you know everything and you have the answer, you no longer have the physical ability to perform that. It's ironic, isn't it? It's the least you could say about it. It's, it's ironic. Yeah, but it's, it's the truth. It's People true. are living longer and longer, but are they able to give back to society what they did 50 years ago? Uh, maybe, I don't think so. I don't think so. I want to see genius again, Frank, you know? I want to see uh, a Mozart, a real Mozart, I'll say, a, a real Wagner on stage. I want to see a, a, you know, a, a, a Eisenstein or you know, people like Fritz Lang, you know, these people that, uh, I want to see another birth of a Bauhaus, really, where it was, take a cold shower at five o'clock in the morning, no matter if the weather is 
35 degrees below zero. It's cold and be sitting, waiting for your lecture. I think it's, uh, it's educational, you know, pe people know that life is not a comfortable thing, but that the education they're receiving is they're so hungry for that kind of stuff uh, that having, that is a gift, that's a gift. Education is a gift, needs to be cultivated. Culture is a gift. Culture needs to be cultivated. It's almost like an oxymoron, but it, it, we need, in this time, what you and I are doing right now, hopefully will be watched by people and hopefully it might influence people in a beneficial way, inspire people because inspiration is the only fuel we have. Gasoline doesn't fill us, but inspiration will. It keeps you awake at night, makes you produce stuff, makes you think. I look out of the window here in the middle of the night and I look at the still water, you know, maybe a little boat passing by between Queens and Manhattan. And I don't know why it fills my heart with love. You know, I feel passion coming back because of one image which in rea is not the reality, because the guy driving that boat in the middle of a freezing weather, in the middle of the East River with no lights on, may be nightmarish to him. To me, it produces love. And that is my mission in life, is to express that love. Um, that's a, what a beautiful and great, great, great um, image. And um, we're coming closer or closer at the hour end, and this should be the last sentence, but. It, Still want to ask: Are you preparing? Are you directing next year or in two years? Are you have, what? Are you doing a stage direction? That's work coming up scheduled. I know everybody has halted everything in theaters, but do you have uh, things lined up? I do. I have a, a new play called Gastrointestinal Prayer. Meaning, I have a, uh, the the coming back of a play that I did in 1996 called Nowhere Man coming back, uh, like Earth and Trance came back. In, in Sao Paulo, in Brazil? Or no, in, Germany, Denmark. Or in Denmark. In Denmark, yeah, and some in Brazil. And I want to open uh, gastro, um, gastrointestinal prayer here in New York as well. So it's a Danish-American production. And, uh, and I'm working with a transvestite, uh, hopefully opening new doors also towards sexuality and stuff like that. And uh, I want to reproduce, I want to give people the idea that Vivaldi might have been a woman. So it's, it's actually called Vivaldi, basically that's what it is. Fantastic, so you-, you oh, four, uh, new, four new things on the horizon. Four new things. Yeah, yeah. Next, next to your writing, you, you mentioned. So things are, are hopeful. And I think yeah, what you said, that ambiguity is that you can have the weaknesses and the strengths, the horror of life, but also the beauty, like the paintings of a Bosch, you know, where you have, hell you have the paradise and the middle is the earth you know that's yeah. reflects uh, in a way and we have really experienced uh, this year and i hope that we, we do learn the lessons and also you know take to heart what you said it's so true and it's real and if there's anything what we share artists with the scientists and and and, and everybody we should just search for truth and uh, as they say you can uh, Never hide the sun or the moon and not the truth. And, um, yeah. and it's for us also to reveal, at least for that moment, as you, you said, said, when we hold uh, life for a second, yeah. You mentioned a wonderful analogy because Hieronymus Bosch and Dante, uh, you, you, people have to remember that the Inferno is called the divine comedy. So that is the thing. And, and Bosch is probably the most divine thing. If there is it yeah. all yeah and we we yeah. went through that so listen thank you for taking the time i know we could talk so much more we could have shown so much uh, from your work uh, that looks like early custard uh, you know and uh, where he got inspired uh -huh. from uh, we could have seen your the great philip glass interview about you so but everybody can go to your website at gerald thomas and find out and tomorrow we will hear from uh, from india and the netherlands uh, we will hear from abhishek tapar who is uh, uh, creating a kind of a lecture performance and trying to to wrestle with what's real, what's not, uh, what is a promotional business talk, and what is the spiritual uh, he heritage of of his country, and uh, how to 
combine these uh, these worlds. And Friday we have the great Sybil Kempson, the New York director and also uh, leader of her Seven Daughters of Eve, and he's now upstate New York where she works and. She did these great ceremonies, you know, at the MoMA. And so let's hear what Sybil is up to. But it was a great start of the week. Really, thank you. Thanks again, Raphael, for connecting us. I hope, uh, uh, Gerald, it was as inspiring for you uh, as one of us listening. Really, thank you. It's a a respect for your work. I'll be calling you on your number. Okay, and really, and uh, um, and thank you, thank you for sharing. To our listeners, thank you for taking time out. Uh, We are slowly coming to an end. Maybe this needle talk might come to an end, the end of July, of June, um, and in the current form. And uh, we will rethink, maybe engage in the parks and engage the idea of a festival here in New York. But um, um, it's been uh, quite a journey. So really, thank you all for listening because it is important for for you, what Gerald has to say, but also for Gerald to know that there's interest, there are listeners out there as it is, you know, for Abhishek Tapar from India who lives in the Netherlands. So um, thanks to HowlRound again, and all of you stay safe, and uh, I hope you will tune in again, and all my best. And again, Gerald, I hope um, you'll see lots of great things uh, looking out of your window. Bye-bye. <laughs> I will like, thank like the artists in their studios, and that's what they often painted and photographed. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Ciao, ciao.